Greetings, everyone, and welcome to R. Kelly Appeal TV. We're discussing the past, the present, and the future of where the case of Robert Sylvester Kelly is going. I would like to thank my commenters and subscribers for coming to the channel regularly. For those who don't know, uh, we are going to be giving away three Cash App uploads May 29th, 2022 at 6 o'clock p.m., right here on the channel. The rules on how to enter is in the description box below. If you have any questions, please submit them to me in the comment area of this video. So our topic today is reflective to a video that I did about Lisa Van Allen description. Well, in the description box, you will find the link to the video. And there was something she said about the Aaliyah and R. Kelly relationship I had to research. What she had to say was that when Rob was with her, he you know, admitted to having a pact with Aaliyah and that they vowed never to share some information. However, Robert seemed to have broken that pact with Lisa Van Allen, supposedly. And she was the only one that he ever told. So I went a little bit deeper and I did a little research for myself and I found some things out. So I'm going to share those thoughts with you today. And it is relating to the R. Kelly and Aaliyah relationship. And the question I have for my commenters is, do you feel that the relationship between the two of them, Aaliyah and Robert Sylvester Kelly, R. Kelly, were a ritualized setup. I'm going to share with you some documented information that you're going to make the decision on. Um, if you feel it is, why? And if you feel it's not, why? So I have an interview that I've compiled together and I will not be discussing them in its entirety because it's way too long. So if you want the link, I will provide it to you to the full video. The first video is where Deion Sanders, I think he is the, used to be the quarterback. I don't know if he's retired or not of the Dallas Cowboys. I'm not sure, but he's one of a football player and he's a professional quarterback and he talks to R. Kelly about receiving prayer. And I feel that this is a great way to start off the video because it's going to get very, very deep. Um, we all know the Aaliyah situation. However, I'm going to be as respectful to both Aaliyah and her family, Robert Sylvester Kelly and his situation that he's going through right now. So let's go. We're about to get real deep. Brother Kelly, I've been trying to get in touch with you. I've been trying to get in touch with you for quite some time. Because you've been on my heart, you've been on my mind, and I can feel you through your music. Brother, will you come up, please? so deep in my spirit dealing with some of the same things that I dealt with and he asked the saints one simple question and so many of you missed it he said would you pray for me could you all extend your hands to this brother everyone extend your hand this way and not just for this dear brother but for everyone that's here that may have a high profile in the community. Let's just pray for them right now. I want to say one last thing, and I'm very conscious of the time. But four weeks ago, Dion, God spoke to us, this church, and said on this night, something very strange and unusual and unrehearsed would happen. And they, this is what, Kurt, God gave us this word, that it would be very strange and unusual it would be a setup by him. And I just want you to pray for this dear man right now. Stretch your hands. He asked for prayer, and I want us to pray for him. Father, I pray 
for this man of God, that you may touch him right now by your power and by your spirit. And Lord, I pray that anything that the enemy has attacked him with, plotted or planned or schemed against him, I break it in the name which is above every name that every onslaught of the enemy will cease and stop from this night on. And I pray, God, that there will be a fresh anointing resting upon him. And, God, I break any generational curses. I break any word curses spoken over him. And I pray once again that the power of the Holy Ghost will breathe upon him a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit. God, touch him now in Jesus' name. Breathe upon him, I pray. Now, in the name of Jesus. Everyone say, in the name of Jesus. Touch him. There it is, sir. There it is. That's it. That's it. That's it. Now we're going to hear a word to R. Kelly from the Honorable Louis Farrakhan. I had a four hour talk with R. Kelly. Now listen, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. He came to our home with six of his friends. And I told him, R. I have had a message in my heart for you for over 20 years. And I'm so glad for the opportunity to share it with you. He was managed by a friend of mine. What's that brother? Barry Hankerson. And Barry told me I'm going to get rid of him. I said, Barry, be patient. I said, that boy is deeply spiritual. A man can't write no songs like that and not have God all up in him, but he's got to be cleansed. Do you understand what I'm saying? All of you in here have done something wrong. But you are not evil people. Somebody got to reach into you and bring out the God that's in you and clear you of your evil. That's why we recorded this song, He Looked Beyond My Faults and He Saw My Need. Brothers and sisters, we will never find the love and the unity and the peace that we deserve unless we are able to look past someone's faults to see what they need and address that need. What are your views regarding the podcast so far? I know I got spiritual on you, but I wanted you to see what was going on with R. Kelly during this time in his life at this particular moment. He was trading in his life at this moment. He was surrounding himself by positive people. When people have a message for you, they should not wait 20 years. They should immediately get the message to you so that you can begin to work on the healing process for yourself. But it's okay because it may not come exactly when we need it, but it'll be right on time. So as long as the healing is getting done, that's all that matters. Now I'm going to show you and um, how his fans at this time was being respected by Robert Sylvester Kelly by what happened next with the Honorable Louis Farrakhan. Here we go. So after the ceremony was done, he went back to Farrakhan's house, and this is the gift that he gave him. Uh, you 
used to think that I could not go on And life was nothing but an awful song But now I know the meaning of true love I'm leaning on the everlasting arms If I can see it then I can do it if I just believe it. There's nothing to it. I believe I can fly. I believe I can touch the sky. I think about it every night and day. Spread my wings and fly away. I believe I can soar. I see me running through that open door. I believe I can fly. I believe I can fly. I believe I can fly. This was a extremely historical moment in life for him. And, you know, afterwards he gave, you know, the honorable... Louis Farrakhan and his wife a hug. And so now we're going to move on to the main individual that ties a lot of this all together. And he has an invested interest. He's a friend of the Honorable Louis Farrakhan. He is a family member of singer um, Aaliyah Dana Houghton, a.k.a. Aaliyah. And he's also the introducer to Robert Sylvester Kelly to Aaliyah. So he's very pertinent in the conversation when we discuss Aaliyah and Rob's relationship. And one of the things that I want to ask is, and this is the research that Lisa Van Allen kind of forced me into researching, was how did he, how did Aaliyah and Robert meet? So this is very vital. Let's listen. Interpreter of musical notes. She was had a photogenic memory. She could read her lyrics and she knew them. So then she could spend the rest of her time performing coming from her heart. In a rare and emotional sit-down with Billboard's executive director of R&B hip-hop, Gail Mitchell, Aaliyah's reclusive uncle, Barry Hankerson, opened up about his niece's legacy, plus exclusively revealed her music will soon be hitting streaming platforms. It's been a long time since the fans could enjoy Aaliyah and other artists on our catalog. There's been a lot of changes in the music business since we took the music off the market, so we want to be sure to be with the right people, the right executives, and to give ourselves the right time to uh, do different things. When you add all that up, it was a couple of years before we could even really consider putting the music out. Hankerson founded Black Round Records back in 1993 specifically as a vehicle to support Aaliyah's music career with a nudge from his sister Diane. My sister's a great singer on her own. She never really got the chance to explore that part of her, her, her life. She did not want her daughter not to get that opportunity. That was the first practical step was somebody wanted me to do that and the next practical step was to figure out how to do that so I convened with Quincy Jones I convened with so many people P. Diddy was a person I convened with I admired him so much in fact the first single we had uh, back and forth was uh, very contested at Jive the owner of Jive Clive called it didn't think it was a hit record I fervently believe that it was. The question was, well, how are we going to get this to the public? Aaliyah shot a music video for Back and Forth and through personal connections. Hankerson was able to premiere the visual before a popular boxing fight, and it was an instant hit, propelling her first record onto the airwaves. I picked stations that had great cities and great listening audiences, and I sent them promotional copies with the caveat so every station agreed to play it at a certain time. So when it went on, it was an explosion of that record. The kids knew that record. They knew it by sight. They didn't know it by ear. They liked to see a record. That's when I just really realized how powerful video was, video was and how photogenic Aaliyah was. And the little coat she wore was a fireman's jacket. And it, literally, people were selling and buying fireman jackets after she wore that. 
began to be kind of a trend, and that's when Aaliyah was kind of getting recognized right off the bat as somebody that had her finger to the pulse of style. And she went on to wear some iconic outfits, and I can't talk about it much. I'll just... He's getting emotional now. But Aaliyah's sudden death in a plane crash in August 2001 at the age of 22 eventually led to her most beloved works going out of print. But now in a new partnership with Bay Area-based independent distributor, label, and publisher Empire, the entire Black Round catalog, not just Aaliyah's works, but 17 albums by artists including Timbaland and Magoo, Tank, Tony Braxton, and JoJo will be available to stream for the first time ever and for both physical and digital purchase for the first time in a decade. So why now? On August 25th, 2020, on the 19th anniversary of Aaliyah's death, her estate ran by Aaliyah's mother along with her older brother Rashad released a statement through the singer's official Twitter account writing, we are excited to announce that communication has commenced between the estate and various record labels about the status of Leah's music catalog as well as its availability on streaming platforms in the near future. For so they were already planning back in 1992 and 93 to change the shift of music to the streaming industry. They were already doing that. The problem, like we we recognized in the Steve Jobs interview with the Sony podcast that we had done on the channel, is that um, they knew to stream it, they would lose money a lot faster. So they pushed people to hurry, to promote people, to do things at this given moment. And it's just so ironic how, you know, all of this came about when R. Kelly was just coming up. So as he was coming up, it was like they both were getting played by the system. And it seems as though possibly they could have both been uh, taken and this could have been planned by so many people prior to them even growing to where they are today, even in death and even in prison. You know, this this thing was very, very big. It was very big back then, but let's keep listening. Hankerson, the statement was a long-awaited green light. I'll be very candid with you. Since the death of my niece, I don't have the same relationship I used to have with my sister. We were very close. But when you lose a child or a niece that you really loved, it was difficult for my family. So a lot of things in my family changed. I really got my cue that she, my sister was ready to put the music out because she said so on the internet. I would have never dreamed that's the way I would have heard it. But she said, it's time to put the music out because there was a conversation we had that she didn't want the music out. And whatever my sister told me, I tried to do what she wanted me to do. As a, as a parent, I would understand if she did not want the music out. Because who wants to hear the voice of your daughter who's gone? Diane does not approve of the catalog's release. The Aaliyah estate made it clear to Billboard that they do not support the deal between Hankerson and Empire, which they claim they were left out of, despite reaching out to Black Round last August in hopes of participating. But Hankerson says his efforts were met with silence, so the plans with Empire are now in place. August 20th will see the release of One in a Million, followed weekly by a rough approximation of the original chronology of Black Round releases. Hankerson will also be relaunching Black Round as a new frontline label with distribution through Empire. When asked what Hankerson initially hoped to do when he first started Black Round, as compared to the label's mission statement today, he said this. A very special signing of, of, of talent. As a black person, um, the only really resource that we have as a people in America are artists and music. An artist helps you bring forth what your people are about. And I had the good fortune to work with some of the biggest artists that ever lived. I was once married to Gladys Knight, which is still one of my favorite artists. But I had so many mission statements, and I'm still, I'm still looking at mission statements. I'm now really caught up to trying to help foster a, a, a system that a, an artist can come to some place and get heard and seen. I really, really hope that in this next phase of background, we can spot talent that maybe doesn't fit the cookie 
cutter of what an artist is and bring them forth on our own platform to give them an opportunity to be seen. But there are still obstacles standing in the way. On January 15th, 2021, the day before what would have been Aaliyah's 42nd birthday and five months after tweeting that negotiations with labels had begun, Aaliyah's estate tweeted another message addressed to fans. We hear you and we see you. While we share your sentiments and desire to have Aaliyah's music released, we must acknowledge that these matters are not within our control and unfortunately take time, adding, while we understand this may be challenging, we need the support of the fans Aaliyah loves so dearly until we can resolve all the issues in freeing her music. And though Hankerson took the estate's first statement on Twitter as a sign of new willingness to engage, he has not personally spoken to his sister about the matter. I'm very prayerful that she enjoys what we're doing. I'm prayerful that she supports what we're doing. But at the end of the day, we'll all find out probably at the same time. I miss her and I love her. I wish we had the same relationship we had years ago. I love my sister. Black Round owns the masters to Aaliyah's recordings, and because she did not write her own music or lyrics, the estate also has no stake in the song's publishing copyrights. Meanwhile, there are currently no plans to release a posthumous album of Aaliyah music, but Hankerson has been hard at work on new songs. We have some features. So, being in the industry that... You were married into Barry Hankerson. You knew how the system ran because you were a big part of it at that time. You might have still been searching for financial balance at this time. So is that why you put Aaliyah out there at such a young age and you forced her into an introduction of of romanticism of sexism because that's what was selling at the time so by the time she's 14 years old she's coming out with aj nothing but a number which is a great indicator that we're not caring about the age gap we're not even worried about that she's saying it so she never produced or wrote her own lyrics so that was putting it out there that was saying to the world this is okay you know, um, and as Aaliyah's mother always stated that the goal was that Aaliyah wanted to be famous. And as she started singing on American Idol, Star Search, very young. And so by the time she turned 15, she probably felt like she was 30. You know, with all of the work and all of the energy that she put into her, her powerful vocal impacts. And you got to also remember too, that R. Kelly got her started. You know, he was the one that tweaked her voice. If you remember the story between um, the BET interview that we did on the channel, when um, he was talking about his life in Chicago, he said, he even gave a clip in that video of how he treated Aaliyah when she was in the studio with them. And she was older by that time, I think 16, 17, somewhere around there. But to be conducted in such a way that seems so immoral at the time, knowing that this is a vibrant man, sexual man, I mean, to put her in that place, it makes me wonder. It makes me wonder, what are your thoughts there? Not saying that R. Kelly did not have a legal and moral obligation to be, you know, upstanding in a sexual manner of respect. But if he has a sexual addiction, it's no different than someone having a addiction to alcohol and you put them in a bar. It's no different than someone having an addiction to um, drugs and you put them in a, in, in a, in a trap house. You know what I mean? The question of the day is, did Barry Hankerson set R. Kelly up with Aaliyah to create the storyline that we're experiencing today? Because you got to think she was the youngest of all the women during the time, right when R. Kelly was stepping up to the scene in the industry. This is a question that make you say, hmm, because the only one who became the most popular celebrity mentored by R. Kelly during this time coming out the door was Aaliyah. And then she left and went on to become platinum.
at such a young age. And I do believe that someone had even made the, the mention that doing the photo shoots in the Bahamas when the plane crashed, it could have been Barry Hankerson possibly rushing her from one exit to the other entrance so money could keep flowing because they only had a certain amount of time before the streaming industry was going to come into the knowledge of, you know, turning over musical rights. So they were in a real fast momentum of trying to get these music areas completed to where the catalog was finished, even all the way down to the, the captain of the shit of the plane, not being professional enough to drive the helicopter, not um, being finding drugs and alcohol in the system, and also being reported as not conducting himself in a manner before and the plane literally having uh, issues four times. Why that plane? And then her being told it, it was stated that she was uh, induced with something. I mean, it's just so crazy. It just all makes sense to me. What are your thoughts? So now we're going to move into another area that I think is very vital to this conversation. And I want to get your view on it. So let's get going. This is a video clip of R. Kelly admitting that he loved Aaliyah, and um, so let's listen. In 1994, he fell in love with an aspiring singer named Aaliyah. I don't mean to be bold, but I gotta let you know, Aaliyah's got a thing for you, and I can't let go. But there was a problem. Kelly was 27 and Aaliyah was 15. Their marriage certificate falsely shows her age as 18. You loved her? Yeah. Yeah. Are you uncomfortable talking about her? Um, not really uncomfortable, but just very respectful. That part of the story is of interest because first indication that Robert Kelly might be interested in very young women. Mm -hmm. That's why well, that's of interest. who's interested in that story. Of course, a lot of people were interested in that story, especially when word broke that the two had secretly married. You tried to hide that at some point, that you didn't get married, but you no. did, right? I vowed that I would not even discuss any of the past, any negative things about Aaliyah. So my memories of Aaliyah... But, but that's not a negative thing, though, that you loved her, is it? Oh, I already said I loved her. In 2001, Aaliyah was killed in a plane crash. Her funeral procession included a horse-drawn carriage and a white coffin. Even though Aaliyah and Kelly's marriage had been annulled years earlier by her parents, her death rekindled questions about Kelly's possible relationships with teenage girls. Do you think that it is immoral for an older man to have sex with an underage girl? Rephrase the question. For an older man mm -hmm. to have sex with an underage girl, someone under 17, mm -hmm. do you view that as an immoral thing? If they're in love. If they're in love, I really, I really can't be the judge of that. So, as you can hear, he was set up. <laughs> he was set up on that, on that interview right there because, you know, he may have looked at because of his history, which we're going to go a little bit deeper. Now we're about to get super spiritual. We're going to talk about the whole ritual type thing that happened. You got to remember, uh, Aaliyah was in the process of being the queen of the cursed or queen of the damned. She was part of Matrix 2 and 3. She was about to really, really get big. Okay. But I truly believe that again, Aaliyah and R. Kelly was not supposed to be in the industry of, of mainstream because the reason that Barry Hankerson hooked them up was to get her out there. Once she's out there and once her name is out there, she'll do whatever she needs to do to get through the system. So the family feels I'll do anything because she just wants to be famous no matter by any means necessary. So he takes on the initiative that probably was planted in his mind. Um, 
because of his addiction and he rolls with it. So now, boom, he's caught up in this big allegation with this underage girl. And then now she's blowing up to the hilt, to the top. But then she's doing things spiritually that the ancestors, I don't believe, was happy with. I don't believe that the ancestors were happy with her talking about um, playing Z and Matrix um, because they said Zion was dying. You know what I mean? And Zion is where? That's in our culture. That's African. You know, so there was a subliminal message even in the Matrix movie but that she never even played the part in order to let us know that the whole culture, the whole system of music was dying immediately. But let's get into this. Now, for those who I do need to let you know, this is a very deep spiritual uh, interview with Miss Joanne Kelly after her death. It's very, it's very unique. So please have an open mind. Um, I'm a universalist and I do believe in um, ancestral energy. And I believe that nothing dies on the planet, even after its physical non-existence. So I need you to bear with me and I'll try to break down as much as I can of this interview. But this is very vital, very crucial. Here we go. Gonna be, I'm not even gonna lie, I'm not gonna hold you up. But what I'm about to tell y'all about R. Kelly, his mother, and R. Kelly's father that we never talk about, girl, y'all are gonna gag, okay? I got a special treat for y'all in this video, so please stick around because they are saying, it, uh, Miss Alex K. Tyler, she does readings, y'all, and she spoke to R. Kelly's mother, and she said that, you know, she. She, girl, is so deep that R. Kelly father, girl, I, I just gotta let her tell it to you, cause you know I mess up stuff. But if I, if I'm not, if I'm gonna get this correct, I believe her father had sex with her, which made R. Kelly. So R. Kelly's father is her mother, his mother's father. You get what I'm saying? And um, it was some uh, demonic spiritual stuff that it was born into, sweetheart. You get what I'm saying? Woo! How she broke it down. I'm going to play a little clip of that. But before R. Kelly reading March the 5th, 2019, if y'all want to hear the full story, of course, I, I'm not going to play the full story. We're going to probably play a couple of minutes. But let's go. Listen to this, honey. Be patient. Be Please be patient. And you got to be a little bit open-minded, okay? Because I know everybody don't have the same beliefs, all right? So here we go. I'm about this shit a long time ago. I told him to stop that shit. I said, oh. So basically what's happening here is she's talking to R. Kelly's mother, okay? Mm -hmm. Like, um, you know how she she does readings. She does other stuff. I can't talk in them terms, but you get the gist. All right, so go ahead. You know who, you, you know how he is? She said, I know, I know how my son is. She said, he just like me. I said, like you. And she said, I, because I started calling her. And I, I said, you, can you hear me? She said, oh. Before she started telling me what she just said. She said, I've been asleep a long time. And I said, Joanne, you hear me? You, you, wait, she said, yes. I've been sleeping. So I'd been out of it, I didn't remember. I had to check because I didn't remember, you know, when she died. And she said, he just like James Cleveland. I said, James Cleveland, the gospel singer? Jane Cleveland. She said, mm-hmm. I said, you knew James Cleveland? She said, I knew James Cleveland. I said, oh, shit. I got to put Ira Kelly and Jane Cleveland together 
then I looked it up. Jane Cleveland was born in Chicago in think, 31. I Kelly wasn't born yet, but his mother was. Allegedly, from what the mother was trying to tell me in the spirit, yes, Alvin, she was a boy lover. You know, they anointed James Cleveland, the king of gospel, and they anointed I Kelly the king of R&B, and both of them is goddamn pedophiles, allegedly, because they have scrubbed the internet. Now, I know some of y'all church folks is going to get mad at me, so I will say allegedly, but this is what I know I heard R. Kelly mother say, they just like that goddamn James Cleveland, he said they are just alike, and they're going to leave the same way. She said, if he don't listen to me, I stop this shit like I have told him before my body died. He's going to leave here like the Reverend James Cleveland. She said, it's my fault. The reason why Robert is the way he is, allegedly. I said, what do you mean? She said that her family was an incest family and her daddy had sex with her. I said, what you saying, that your daddy is Ara Kelly daddy? Allegedly, she looked at me and said, yeah, that Ara Kelly granddaddy is his daddy. I said, okay, well, maybe I'm hearing it wrong, just in case you're not really saying your daddy, and she mentioned Mason, her father, was into the craft. But this is the weird thing. If y'all could find something, please let me know. I never seen R. Kelly's father, and I couldn't find a name for R. Kelly's father, and I can't find a name for R. Kelly's grandfather, and I can't find a picture for R. Kelly's grandfather, which I think is weird. And R. Kelly's brother, Carrie, made a statement that R. Kelly's daddy is his grandfather. His own brother said this. And you see, they're very hush-hush. You don't know no name. You don't see nothing. Yes, she told me it's in a heavy occult family, and she was ritualistically sodomized and vaginally penetrated and that's how she got pregnant and I'm just staring at her and I said you you want to tell me this she said I have to tell you that's wrong that's what's wrong with Robert and she said that I was inappropriate with my own son I was very close with my son but she said it was a little bit incestuous and she said that she had Ara Kelly around them men them church men said she know about it because she was she was born into a satanic and a cult family R. Kelly was a man poor so she was sick and wanted me Yes, but what I'm trying to tell you is, Alvin, she, she couldn't help it. She was born into this game. She was already ritualistically set up to be sacrificed before she was born. When she was a baby, they just, they picked her. She, she was a little girl. That's what she's saying to me. And then they picked Robert, his father. Father, which I, I am saying allegedly, from what she's telling me, I am feeling that the father is genetically a relative of the mother, like the mama daddy. I'm, y'all, I don't want to say this, but this is what I believe. I hear the mother saying, and that the father 
is a very powerful mason and high occult. Hey, Teresa. High occult. Voila. She couldn't help it. She said she had no, no power, no rights to speak. She was a child. So then she's told what to do. I'm going to tell you where it came from. She said, I, I did it. R. Kelly was little men's was sucking, allegedly was sucking R. Kelly all. They was church men's. And men started to give him money. Just so I told you it was going to get deeper. Um, Joanne said it was her fault that, you know, we don't know the historical background that created his sexual addiction, R. Kelly's sexual addiction. So it, could it have been a ritualized practice that at a certain age, a woman must be sacrificed in order to keep the elevated dimension of superstar status? Um, could Aaliyah have been involved in this same ritual? Because somehow or another, she got out and there's something that happened to where maybe she went against the grain of the ritual and started working on territories of her own. And she got out of the um, umbrella of the cult or whatever you want to call this um, ritual. And that could have been because she was spiritually messing with some dark energy. She was familiar with, I mean, because if you look at, like I said, the queen of the damned or queen of the cursed, she was doing a ritual in that, in that movie. I remember it. I remember it very vividly, but I don't remember watching the whole movie. I just remember that ritual. So what are your thoughts about this? Um, this just came to me um, after doing the research from what Lisa Van Allen was saying about the pact between Aaliyah and Robert. So I'm bringing this out because I feel that people should know um, why if we're speaking in specifically on Robert Sylvester Kelly, how his addiction came to be. Did anybody recognize that? Has anyone heard of that story before? And if so, could you link us if you know who his father is, where his father's at, um, why Joanne? Because I know in the book, she specifically got on him when he asked about his father, when other people, when, when other sisters and brothers were going around, you know, seeing their fathers. So I, um, she said, Carrie said that statement that R. Kelly's father was his grandfather. Now I'm not promoting gossip in any way, shape or form. I'm just trying to make sense of all the research. And that was a part that I really didn't want to bring in here, but I had to because of the fact that this is so deep. So what are your thoughts? And what about all the other people with big money who got away with doing things with minors and, you know, being promiscuous and it's like the rules are set up to protect those with power. And imagine the power that R. Kelly had at this time. And even that wasn't enough to remove the stigma of this whole ritual and this whole sexual um, addiction thing, um, let alone an everyday person who's caught up in the system. Um, that's caught up in the system, man. You know, um, it's really it's really something. It's very ironic. And for all this hell breaking loose in his life at the time when he was just coming up shows that maybe he wasn't supposed to be part of the mainstream music culture, no matter how talented he was. He was not supposed to be there because with that came all this. Okay. Now, um, I did have one more thing that I wanted to talk to you about. Um, but I think this is enough for today. Um, I have a little bit more research on Aaliyah. I'm just, you know, let's do an interview with her and just to clear the air and bless her energy. Let's go.
years old. But Demetrius testified that he didn't do this alone. Actually, he and a few other members of R. Kelly's inner circle accompanied R. Kelly and Aaliyah to a Chicago area city hall where the couple applied for marriage license. So a lot of people were witnessing this and allowing it to go down. Shortly after they obtained their marriage license, they actually married in a Sheraton hotel near the Chicago O'Hare airport. It also looks like they had a minister there officiating the wedding, which again, like as someone who is kind of religious, like holy crap, how can you trust the church if they're over here witnessing this and allowing it to happen and marrying them? As you guys know, the marriage was annulled in February 1995, so they weren't married long. But it actually looks like R. Kelly has admitted to getting physical with Aaliyah back in the day. This article reports that R. Kelly finally admits to having underage inappropriate contact with Aaliyah. In a statement to The Independent, one of R. Kelly's lawyers wrote that the defense does concede that R. Kelly had underage inappropriate contact with Jane Doe number one. The reason why Aaliyah's name isn't included here is because they didn't want to include it because she passed away back in 2001. She's legally unavailable, so she's just Jane Doe number one. I truly hope that justice is served because R. Kelly has done so much damage. It's time for him to be held accountable. I mean, there are so many victims right now pressing charges against him that there's no way in hell he's not going to get some type of criminal charges. But it's a little bit too late for Aaliyah because, as you guys know, she unfortunately passed away. So before we talk about her relationship with Dame Dash, let's go ahead and talk about the tragic plane accident that took Aaliyah's life. In late August 2001, Aaliyah was in the Bahamas filming a music video for her song Rock the Boat. After filming the music video, she boarded a plane with a couple of her team members, but less than a minute after taking off, the jet fell from the sky and plummeted to the ground just 200 feet from the runway. Aaliyah was one of six passengers who died at the scene, while three others died a few hours later. Later. It's pretty incredible to think that one of the biggest celebrities at that time could pass away in this manner. Because if you think about it, if a plane goes right up and right back down, there's obviously something wrong with that plane. So who prepared this flight for Aaliyah and why was she boarding a plane that was clearly unsafe? A few years after the crash, the National Transportation Safety Board launched an investigation that revealed several irregularities. First, the plane was severely overweight. It was so heavy that once it goes up, it's bound to go down. Second, the pilot did not have the certifications to fly this aircraft. Like, so why is this pilot even trying to fly a plane that they don't know how to fly? Furthermore, that same pilot was previously charged with a drug offense in the U.S., and an autopsy of his body found that he had cocaine and alcohol in his system at the time of the crash. So he's flying one of Hollywood's finest, and he's all messed up on drugs, which is not okay. Personally, I'm not great at traveling. I get so much anxiety, and honestly, I've had this thought run through my mind a few times. Like, what if your pilot is super messed up? I mean, I saw a video of, like, one pilot trying to go and fly a plane when they were clearly drunk and it makes me worried to ever go on a plane again as he's getting ready to fly from minneapolis to san diego but when gabriel schroeder gets close to his gate a random secondary check is set up as he sees what's happening police say his demeanor changes when asked to put his bag on the table he tells police i'm not ready and turns and walks away suspicious officers ask that the pilot be tracked through the airport and these surveillance cameras show that 37-year-old finding an escalator, heading down a floor to a men's bathroom in late July. He's in that bathroom for only 30 seconds, where police say they later found a bottle of vodka stuffed in one of the trash cans. Now, let me tell you, I have driven, I have been a passenger on a plane, and when you take one shot, you're feeling so super good. You're, it's, there's a difference when you take a shot on an airplane. It does something way different than it does on the on the ground. So I know I would never be able to handle a plane, <laughs> let alone 
to keep my eyes open. Wow. But anyways, that plane in particular had some problems. This article claims that the plane itself had been sighted four times in four years before the fatal crash, including once for a safety violation. Other reports pointed to there being too many people, as well as excessive baggage on board. It also looks like another pilot noted that our original pilot, who was on all these drugs, had issues getting one of the engines started, so this plane was doomed from the beginning. This article also reported that Aaliyah's team got into a heated argument with the pilot because of the excessive weight, but ultimately went through with the flight anyways. This article claims that Aaliyah was an anxious flyer, which honestly, same, and that she would not have gone on this plane with all of this excessive baggage. Actually, they note that there was a chartered plane set to pick her up the next day, so why did she get on this small plane where they were arguing? about whether to fly it or not. It seems like Aaliyah would have just stayed behind if she had the choice to. If she had the choice to. And I believe that she was on schedule and she was running so far behind schedule. And I, I do remember her saying that she wanted to get home to her boyfriend, Damon Dash or whatever, and that somebody else had set up the flight itself. So what are your thoughts on that? I mean... She was trying to get to another location because she could have, like he said, waited one more day, one more day. Wow. What are your thoughts? But it appears that Aaliyah didn't have a choice. And actually, it was recently revealed that she was drugged before getting onto this plane because Aaliyah didn't want to go. So they gave her a pill and made her pass out. They put her onto this plane that was extremely overweight. The weight was not even distributed properly. It was uneven. They flew her and quickly crashed. And a shocking claim making headlines. Iondali alleging the artist may have been medicated before boarding that fatal flight. I had to tell the story as it was told to me and as the um, off record multiple people who spoke about the, the incident said to me as well. You can't be told that someone was handed a pill and moments later was brought upon a plane after moments before that she was adamant about not getting on. Now whatever that pill was I can't say but what I can say is that she didn't want to get on the plane. Well, why didn't they do an autopsy of the blood toxicology within her body? Because they could have definitely told, found that she, if she was drugged or not, right? Did anybody ever hear that they did a toxicology report on Aaliyah? Because if they did it on the pilot, why wouldn't they have done it on Aaliyah if people were saying that she had been drugged? Just a question, curious. But what I can say is that she didn't want to get on the plane. So let's talk about this book that claims that Aaliyah was drugged and forced to board the plane before the fatal crash. Which, again, that makes me think, like, okay, who set this up? Who tried to plan to get rid of Aaliyah by doing this? The book is titled Baby Girl, better known as Aaliyah. And they claim that the singer refused to board the plane. She wasn't getting onto it, but she was given a sleeping pill and was carried into the plane while fast asleep. The person who revealed this information is named Kingsley Russell. He was only 13 at the time of the tragedy, but he was working for his father's taxi and hospitality business, so he was helping Aaliyah's team with the baggage. His mother was actually Aaliyah's driver during her time on the island, and his aunt was handling the team's transportation and scouting locations for filming. Actually, his aunt, Annie Russell, testified back in 2003 that she was concerned about the team having too much video equipment on the plane. What's bizarre about this Russell family is that they have tried speaking about this before, but they seem to be silenced. Actually, Kingsley Russell posted a YouTube video that's now been deleted where he explained how the bizarre death of Kobe Bryant with the helicopter crash was triggering because it reminded him of the day he watched Aaliyah being taken on board of the fatal flight while she was a asleep, knocked out by a pill that a member of her team had given her. And I also read in another article that 
In the Matrix movie, the same a month before or after Aaliyah dies, one of the characters on the Matrix set dies one month either before or after her, some lady named Gail. And I ran into that information. So what are your views on that? Like, do you feel that there was some things being twisted around or moved around in order to protect the reality of what was really going on so we wouldn't be able to ask Aaliyah any questions because the, she was getting ready to get into the hot seat because if she had been alive, she would have definitely been forced to testify, I believe. So what are your thoughts on that? Would she have been able to make it through the testimony um, with this pact, this ritualized pact? Kingsley Russell explained that they were already experiencing a two-hour delay due to the plane's late arrival. He claims that Aaliyah grew even more flustered when she finally saw the small plane and refused to board it. At the same time, the pilot was insisting that the plane would be too heavy with eight passengers, including Aaliyah's 300-pound bodyguard and all of their luggage and video equipment. Aaliyah was pushing back against her team, and she actually climbed into the taxi van complaining of a headache and she said she was going to try to take a quick nap. Meanwhile, her camp continued to try to convince the pilot to fly them with all of their luggage. Eventually, Kingsley claims that one of Aaliyah's team members came to check on her and she reiterated that she did not want to get on the tiny plane and that she had a headache. At that moment, that team member brought out a pill. Aaliyah took the pill and fell into a deep sleep, which she remained in when the pilot it finally agreed to fly the group back to Florida. Kingsley. That sounds like a Walt Disney movie, like Anastasia or, you know, Swamp, the, the, the Swamp Princess, the, the, the very thing that creates the storyline to the truth. And um, I'm not sure, but again, I asked the question, what was her toxicology report? That would have simply explained everything said they took her out of the van. She didn't even know she was getting boarded on a plane. She went into the airplane asleep. When Aaliyah's body was recovered nearly 20 feet away from the wreckage, she was still strapped into her seat, slumped to the left with her 5 foot 7 frame folded over. An autopsy report concluded that her survival was unthinkable, citing her extensive burns and major head trauma. So clearly, that's one of the most traumatic ways you could die. I mean, imagine not wanting to board this plane and then being drugged and then being forced to board this plane. And I'm assuming that she passed away without even knowing what was going on. Like she must have been asleep when the plane crashed, which I'm glad it was at least peaceful for her. She wasn't like screaming when the plane was going down. But it's so wrong that her team felt inclined to go and put her in such a dangerous situation. You guys might be wondering, what does R. Kelly think of this? because you guys know they dated and all that but actually at that time when she died in the accident she wasn't dating R. Kelly and she moved on and had a whole new man Aaliyah was in a relationship with Dame Dash he's the co-founder of Rockefeller Records there are a bunch of conspiracy theories about Aaliyah's passing this article writes some theories claim that Aaliyah's link with these industry moguls ultimately led to her death two weeks before the crash Aaliyah was spending time at the summer house owned by Dash and Jay-Z in East Hampton. There is one outlandish conspiracy about Aaliyah's death. It includes Dame Dash, Jay-Z, and Beyonce, the Illuminati. Honestly, I don't know how much I believe of it, but I'm going to include it. Here it goes. The claim that the Illuminati runs the entertainment business is hardly new. It should, therefore, come as no surprise that one popular theory around Aaliyah's death is that she was killed as a sacrifice, with many citing Jay-Z, Beyonce, and Dash as the main offending parties. As with most of these theories, proponents of it believe Aaliyah wanted to get out of the society or maybe even reveal the truth about it, and this believed to be what got her killed. I now, I did read something also real quick to interject that Beyonce would not be who she was if Aaliyah was still alive. I don't know. That was a um, article that I glanced over when I was doing this research. So what are your, what, what are your thoughts on that? Again, I don't know how 
how valid that theory is because it implicates Jay-Z and Beyonce and this uh, Dame Dash guy. So I don't know if I necessarily believe it, but Aaliyah was in one movie during her time that actually kind of reflects that same conspiracy theory. The movie is titled Queen of the Damned. It's about blood drinking vampires in the music business who plan to take over the world. A now, mind you, vampires was Aaliyah's thing. She loved vampire, vampire movies and different things like that. So this was the video that I was saying that she was messing with the ancestors energy, that dark energy. You cannot mess with that. You cannot mess with that unless you're going down that path and you're going to whatever happens, happens, you know. Leah played the role of Akasha, a.k.a. the Queen of the Damned. Without going into details, the movie ends with another vampire sucking all of Akasha's blood and then taking her life. Afterward, that vampire became the new Queen of the Damned. Some people believe that Beyonce wanted to get Aaliyah out of the music industry so that she could be the queen, but honestly, that just, like, like really makes me uncomfortable to start thinking about that because I don't know, like, could, I don't, I just... That doesn't seem like reasonable or plausible. Like I'd much rather talk about like how the pilot was all drugged out and how they, you know, overstuffed the plane than, you know, trying to convince people that Beyonce was a part of this. Because frankly, I don't believe that. There's enough room in the music industry for everyone. And honestly, mm -hmm. Aaliyah would have been thriving nowadays. And actually soon, people are going to be able to stream her music, which is something a lot of fans have been asking for for decades now. So Aaliyah's music is finally headed to streaming sites, which I feel like is way overdue, but it actually looks like her family isn't ready yet. You guys remember Aaliyah's Uncle Barry? Well, he actually owns the rights to her music, and he claims that there have been arguments and disagreements within the estate and that's why the music hasn't been available. It actually looks like Aaliyah's mother, Diane, didn't want the music out. Uncle Barry said, as a parent, I would understand if she did not want the music out because who wants to hear the voice of your daughter who's gone? So when she said that to me, I said, okay, we're not putting it out. I don't know when, but one day we will. I don't know what's gone down between Uncle Barry and the rest of the estate, but it looks like he's ready to release the music under Black Round Records, and it doesn't look like Aaliyah's parents want it out. This message was posted to Aaliyah's social media account, and they wrote, Protecting Aaliyah's legacy is and always will be our focus. For 20 years, we have battled behind the scenes, enduring shadowy tactics of deception with unauthorized projects targeted to tarnish. We have always been confused as to why people are causing more pain than what we've already had to cope with. Now, in this 20th year, this endeavor to release Aaliyah's music without any transparency or full accounting to the estate compels our hearts to an expressed word forgiveness. It also looks like the family is going to defend themselves. Uh, they write, although we will continue to defend ourselves and her legacy lawfully and justly, we want to preempt the inevitable attacks on our character by all the individuals who have emerged from the shadows to leech off of Aaliyah's life work. So it sounds like there's a group of people who are trying to get Aaliyah's music out there, trying to make more money off of her and everything she's done, which honestly, they can make a ton of money off of her. But her family wants to respect her legacy. And honestly, they want other people to respect their wishes, but it doesn't look like they're going to get that. At the end of the day, if Aaliyah's parents don't want the music out there, it shouldn't be. No matter how much or how badly we want it on streaming services, which trust me, I am ready for it, but we can't be that selfish. And it just shows that people in the industry are working overtime to deceive this family and try to get this music out there. It makes me think who's actually going to be making the money off of this music. I have no idea, but I hope that Aaliyah's legacy can outshine all of the corruption in Hollywood, her horrid relationship with R. Kelly, and the tragic accident that took her life. She is so much more than these dark moments 
moments in her life, and I know that she will be remembered, but we must embrace her for the right reasons, because she's someone who we ultimately failed. We allowed her to be in this relationship with R. Kelly. Her team allowed her in a dangerous situation that ultimately took her life, and it's time to put some respect on her name. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I love Aaliyah, and I just think it's time to really embrace her now that 20 years have gone by. And so that is the interview that I want to share about Aaliyah. And may she rest, and may she be happy where she is. Um, I'm going to read a few comments, and then we're going to be done. Um, another fun fact was that Aaliyah graduated with a 4.0 grade point average. Not only was she incredibly gifted, but she was also very intelligent. And this goes out to S104N, um, Basketball Boomin Browse. I'm genuinely worried about your sleep schedule. You managed to research these topics, organize clips, and put them into an easy to digest video. And on top of that, you post twice a week. Thank you. He is a phenomenal researcher. I really, really like him. Um, JD, eight months ago, she always had the saddest eyes to me. You could tell the moment she was truly happy and the moment she was not and putting on a brave front for the cameras. You could tell if she had more time on earth that she was going to get rid of the lame circle around her, especially the people who put her on the plane drugged and grow into her own. Gone, gone way too soon. Rest in heaven. Miss Packnett, the sad part for me is that Aaliyah's legacy is always going to be tainted because she will be associated with the group. Aaliyah was such a talented singer and she has such a great fashion sense and was an amazing actress. I'm sure she would have been huge if she was still alive today. It's so sad that it's been 20 years since she passed and it's still frustrating that all of her music is in streaming so other people can listen to her music. She was just an icon, simply put. One more. Michelle says five months ago, for those of you who weren't around during the time she was alive, I'll just say that she was a huge star. Beyonce was just starting off as a solo artist, so Aaliyah was it. I was nine years old and my friend ran from her house and told me that she died in a plane crash. I literally did not believe her. I couldn't wrap my head around how a star of that magnitude can just die. It was definitely a huge loss for her fans. Yes, it was. And again, may she be in peace. May the family um, receive our condolences. And hopefully this video has respectfully put respect on her name um, and clarified some, some things that I believe that any appeal court judge should want to hear. Um, and we thank you so much for liking, commenting, sharing, and subscribing to this channel and listening to this podcast. Um, again, the description box information is below if you want to um, apply for the winning for the Cash App giveaway. May 29th, three people will be um, gifted uh, $25 on their Cash App upload on that day, 6 o'clock. And the rules are in the description. So thank you so much again. And as always, keep it 100 and we'll see you next time.